Yes. Quickly change. Do we have to switch? No, it's okay. Okay. So. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Britta Redling. I'm writing for the German news magazine Focus, and I'm here, the moderator of this beautiful panelist today. And we are going to talk about digital participation of women in European politics. And uh, I got some of the most influential women in digital politics here. Uh, I'd like to introduce to you. It's Anke dunschert berg Teresa Bücker, Kat Braybrook, and Marietje Schrake. Um, just a few remarks before we start. Um, the participation of women in European politics and in economy uh, is still very low. And I'd like to talk with you a little bit about the reasons behind that. So I'd like to start with you, Marietje Schrake. Maybe you could introduce you with just some words and we could discuss later what you think are the most influential reasons why women are still underrepresented in politics and economy. Okay, well good afternoon, it's a pleasure to be here in this wonderful location uh, and I'm glad that we're also joined by people through live stream. So um, I'm a member of the European Parliament from the Netherlands, I've been since, uh, since three years, I represent a progressive liberal party from the Netherlands called D66 and I focus on international relations, international trade and also Europe's digital agenda. Uh, I'm not an expert at all on, on women's issues but apparently you know just being a woman uh, and working on technology and being in politics uh, is a reason to discuss this topic. Um, one of the reasons why uh, women are underrepresented is, is that they're still a lot of cultural problems, uh, a lot of stereotyping through education, especially when it comes to making decisions uh, on whether to go into different fields like care or education or other sectors are pushed more uh, uh, for girls. Uh, and I think that it's really important that we take this topic out of sort of traditional discussions of, of women's issues. Mm. Because if I look at the audience, this is this is a majority women's audience. Uh, this is an all women's panel. Um, but the most important case for including more women in politics, in the economy and in technology in the workforce is actually an economic one. Mm -hmm. uh, companies that have more women in their top level management do better. Uh, there's a huge market out there for, for companies to tap into. So I think it's very important if we want to make a difference on the top and the top is still dominated by hmm. men who in the business uh, sector need to make money, uh, then that's what we need to discuss. We, we got a great debate about what you call quotas. Are you for quotas in companies? Well, I wish it wasn't necessary. Okay. So I think we have to make sure that there's a, a, a tackling of the core challenges, so the cultural problems, the educational problems, the opportunities that people get. Uh, those are the things we need to we need to challenge. Um, there's a lot of people who ask me because I was uh, 30 when I first got elected to the European Parliament. Uh, yes, I'm a woman. Uh, who were asking whether that was because I was the women, the, the woman highest on my political party's list. And actually, no, uh, there is another woman on our party's list who was higher on in the ranks than I was. So that was not the reason why I got elected. But I personally think it's an insult to suggest that the reason why I would be elected is because of my gender. Uh, it's a discrediting of my voters. They're not stupid. They vote for people who they believe represent them, uh, who can make their issues uh, uh, heard and, and to make a difference. So um, I don't ever want to be a part of a quota. And I hope we can all work together to prevent the need for quota in general. But it's hard, and if things don't start improving very, very quickly, we may face a moment in time where we need to start uh, working with quota. When you arrived in Brussels, I, I read in the newspaper you even had a Wi-Fi in your bureau. Is this getting better? 
slowly, yeah. But okay. we have horrible uh, networks and, and systems. That's a whole different topic, but it's a nightmare. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's something to improve. But we do have Wi-Fi now, so okay. that helps. Yeah. My, my second panelist is Kat Braybrook, who came from the UK to us. Uh, could you introduce yourself with some, some sentence? Sure. Uh, I'm Kat. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I come from London and I work for the Open Knowledge Foundation, which supports openness um, through different means, uh, basically trying to get hackers and coders together with people in, in governments to promote open data and open source software and, and open cultures of different kinds. Um, but one of the things that I did before I did this job is I did a master's at University College London where I followed around 30 different hackers for about six months um, as an anthropologist and did an immersive ethnography of their, the role of gender embodiment in their experiences as hackers. Um, so I followed them to conferences like Chaos Communication Camp and tech cons and hack spaces and just tried to find out what it was like to be a hacker uh, who's millennial age, who is into open source hacking, but who also happens to be a woman. Um, and I was comparing their experiences to the experiences of a bunch of women in 2001 who did a study um, by Ghosh and a bunch of other academics who found that in free Libra open source software, so FLOSS communities, only 1.5% of those communities were women. And in that study, they found that a lot of women cited um, feeling uh, very isolated and alone and feeling discriminated against as reasons why they did not engage in tech subcultures more often. So I wanted to find out for younger women, women at my age in 2011, what were their experiences like? And my conclusions were that for these women, it was not discrimination that kept them from getting involved more. It was a sense of isolation, the mm. sense that they were alone. They were often uh, felt like they were prototypes. They had to represent women always if they were the only woman in a group of men, male hackers. But they also said that online, they felt that in a way they were able to transcend gender and, and sort of have a post-gendered form of self. Um, they cited people like Donna Haraway, cyborg anthropologists who um, are sort of post-gender theorists as inspirations in their work. So, I, I so we still got the stereotype. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I think it's interesting that the, for the women that I studied, their virtual selves were more liberated than their physical selves as far as gender. And they were able to move past gender and be respected for their, their knowledge and code. Okay. Teresa Bücker, my, my third panelist here, is working with politicians. He's explaining the internet to politicians, to German politicians here, for the SPD, for the Social Democratic Party. Could you give me a short impression about what you're doing the whole day? Well, um, I work for the... Can you hear me? Can you hear me or is it? Oh, okay. okay. We got some... Is it better? Okay, okay. yeah. I can hold it. <laughs> I can hold it up. <laughs> uh, I've been working for the um, Social Democratic Parliamentary Group for the last couple of weeks and before that for the Executive Committee. And what I've been trying to do the past years is, uh, on the one hand, trying to open up politics for digital participation. And that is, uh, well, at first, um, bringing skills and knowledge about how the internet and how com communication online works and still in 2012 we're at the very beginning where only like roughly a third of our politicians is acti ac actively using social media but um, the, the other challenge is I think um, really trying to understand what uh, people expect from digital participation how they want to participate do they want to vote, do they want to write longer papers, do they, like, how do they want to take part, because what I've, I've, um, I've seen in the past months or years is that all the um, offers we make to the public um, is not really being accepted, so there are a lot of offers to participate and um, to bring your ideas into politics, but um, the percentage of people who really want to participate is really low and um, the percentage of women who want to participate is even lower and one of the main reasons for the low uh, participation of women I think is that we lack role models you would think uh, mm -hmm. especially in Germany that with Angela Merkel at the top uh, was just voted the most powerful woman in the world by Forbes I think yesterday uh, 
we would have a female role model or more female role models, but I think um, especially in politics, there are not a lot of women who younger women look up to. Even in your party? Well, you know, we have the Troika and <laughs> I don't Only think there's a woman in that Troika. So. <laughs> Anke, uh, you are even in politics then in the internet, you work on open government and you are in a pirate party. Could you give us uh, a little impression about what, what you are doing? Well, for this panel it's probably also relevant what... Oh, I think we got a sound problem. What I had been doing... Or <laughs> is that better now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I start all over again. <coughs> I think for this panel is probably also relevant what I had been doing. I was 15 years working in the IT industry with Accenture, with the business technology office of McKinsey and lastly with Microsoft. And um, this, in all three cases, it was a very male-dominated environment. And if you asked at the beginning, Uh, why is it um, that it's sometimes still so difficult that women can progress? And my experience was that in especially male-dominated environments, stereotyping functions much stronger than in other environments. Because one of those stereotypes, for example, tells IT and women that does not go too well together. And with uh, McKinsey, I was IT strategy project manager and always a new project every so many months. And always I was the first woman working together with the team and I was not only the first female colleague, I was also the first female manager, both at the same time. And I can tell that I think every single time we lost at least four to six weeks on the project because I had the subtle feeling that my colleagues, although I had 10 years experience and they something like six to 10 months, they didn't really trust me in being able to lead an IT project. I could never really prove it, but I could feel it every single time. And one day on a particularly big IT project, when I was presented at the new manager from the McKinsey partner, He told me that four weeks later, he didn't do it at the time when it happened, but he was approached by the IT boss of this company, where I was presented as the new project manager, and that IT manager from the client said, oh my God, that's a really big, important project. We decide on procurement of <laughs> 1 billion euro IT. This must be somebody capable, and it's all male guys on the team. Can she really cope? And are you sure? I mean, it's a woman. So my boss didn't tell me that. Uh, but he said, of course, she's great. That's why we brought her in. And four weeks later, that same client manager came to him again. That's when he told me the story and said, you were right. She really copes. She can do it. She's okay. I'm happy you brought her in. So I got told the entire story as a very nice compliment. And of course, it was kind of nice to hear that he found out I could cope. But at the same time, it's a really sad story. It's very seldom that you get to know these things, but it's very often that they do happen in the heads of the people you deal with. And so I am pretty sure that when I had the subtle feeling with my other colleagues that that was not just an invention of my brain, there was something. And it always disappeared after something like four to six weeks. But I always had to prove, like in a continuous assessment center, that yes, I'm a woman and I'm still not stupid in IT. <laughs> and that's, that's the sad thing. And it makes it much more difficult for women to progress. But uh, to sum that up, that was the 15 years of my life. But I decided then to work independent for the two passions of my life and founded a year and some months ago two businesses. One is called Fempower Me. And I bring in all the experience I collected in those 15 years in the corporate world, fighting to break glass ceilings, and that is now something I give back to other women managers, but also to including male board members to tell them how, how the various building blocks of the glass ceiling actually works and what you can do about it. As a woman, as colleagues, as a boss, as a personal manager, as a board member, 
there are many little things you can do. So that is one business. The other one is called Open Gafni, and that is doing what you just said. It's helping politics and governments to become more open and transparent and just push them. Did you, did someone in, in this, in this uh, round here, um, some had some um, ideas about the glass ceiling? Did, you, did it happen to you? Already? Well, for me personally, no. My experience has been more than I could have ever expected and I'm very grateful for the opportunities that I've had and also, also the various mentors, men and women, uh, that I've had um, who have helped me to get to where I am. But I do think when you work in a culturally diverse environment, even within Europe, so the European Parliament you know, has people from all 27 member states uh, and beyond, that I was confronted with stereotypes without realizing it myself when I started working and uh, people from mostly southern European, but I don't want to stereotype myself now, but this is... Uh, <laughs> Uh, I could I could count this uh, and some Eastern European countries were asking multiple times what does your father do and initially I didn't really understand <laughs> this question but later I understood that the assumption was that he must have been a wealthy donor to my political party because otherwise you know why would I have that position I didn't get that could you could you explain it a bit well in some countries um, women apparently only get opportunities uh, or the perception is that women only get opportunities if their families are in a political clan ah, okay. or if their family slash fathers are uh, important donors to political parties financial ah. uh, sponsors um, and there are stereotypes in different different countries but my um, I mean as soon as I understood what was going on I thought well the only way uh, to deal with this is to just be very good at what I do uh, and that didn't require change because I was always ambitious and I think it's important to do your homework well when you're in the political arena so that didn't require change on my side but it was an eye-opener to understand through questions how people saw me mm. um, but I think especially now uh, I'm you know past that point uh, but I have learned that it's important to actually explicitly do something for equal treatment for women, equal opportunity for women, uh, where when I came into my job I didn't think it was necessary in Europe today and sadly uh, it still is, but I think that we are also a little bit a part of the problem. Um, I think it would have been great to also have the person uh, from your previous company here or the CEO mm. of a tech company to talk about why he only has 30%, 12%, 5% women uh, in his staff and how many of them are, are managers. Um, I think if we continue to make women's issues, women's rights, women's opportunities, equal opportunity uh, a women's issue, then we're never going to win this battle. So I've actually, I'm going to write a blog after this panel uh, and I'm making a promise and I already said it on Twitter but I just in front of you all and maybe you can help to be part of this change. I'm not going to sit on all women's panels on women's issues ever again. <laughs> okay. I don't think it's helpful. So I think we all need to reach out to the people who are furthest away from what we believe in and try to get them on board and try to get the other side of this question included in the discussion. You told me before that you are co working on a, a digital policy now, on a digital strategy. Maybe you could give us a brief impression what you are writing. Yeah, so the thing I'm working on, uh, which is coming to an end today because I have the big deadline, is a, a draft report uh, which will map the first strategy for uh, a digital freedom policy for the EU in its external action, so foreign policy and IT. Okay. It deals with human rights, with trade, with development, uh, things like that. And what's your main thesis? Um, it's very hard because it's a lot of it's things. Secret. But one of the key... No, no, it's not at all secret. It's very open. Uh, I've put a discussion paper online uh, for weeks. People have been given input, which has been extremely helpful. I think one of the key things I'm focusing on now, um, which I believe are very important, is that Europe stops exporting technologies that are used for uh, mass surveillance, censorship, uh, like in tracking Syria, and tracing maybe. of, of mm. individuals in countries like mm. Syria and Iran. Mm. But it's, I mean, those are the most extreme cases we all know, and they are now facing sanctions. But I'm also talking about many other countries where uh, it's not so obvious that people are being repressed, but where Europe is saying one thing politically 
uh, that there is no rule of law, that people are being uh, repressed, that human rights are not upheld, while we are uh, not looking at what our companies are doing, and we need transparency and accountability there. And I think that that's uh, extremely important in general, but it's also a part of my report. If, if it comes to the awareness for digital politics in the EU, is the EU very aware of all these things going on in the net? Not so much. Okay. But we're getting there. Okay. <laughs> like like Teresa, I, I think we, we were discussing this topic before. You are the one, one person as a social media strategist for your party. It's not enough, you know. It's yes, and I have uh, 150 members of parliament to work with. Okay. So it's How do you manage to work for all this? Guys, I have no clue. It's um, well, <laughs> but it's not only politics. You see, companies all over Europe bringing people in to um, start working with social media, and they think, okay, one, one is going to be enough because it's only the internet, and um, it basically works by itself, and you don't need man or woman power to to get it working. But um, what I'm doing right now with our politicians is that I do um, a one-to-one -one coaching. To, to help them get online and start communicating with the public. And is it working? <laughs> well, um, <laughs> <I've all laughs> well, with some people it's working excellent and others uh, are refusing to do it. But it's, oh. uh, I think it, it mirrors what we see in the general public because we still have a lot of citizens who will not participate online. Wh why are they refusing? Well, because there's um, a lot of prejudices against um, digital activism and that people actually use, uh, use the internet in a political sense because um, like our older politicians, I guess, think uh, the internet is about fun and not about political change. Mm -hmm. That's what, what is happening and if they don't start participating, they're going to miss out on extremely important uh, political change. Anke, is the, the web about fun yes. for you? <laughs> Maybe you could give her a mic. I said the, the web is also about fun. I mean, the web is reflecting the entire life. So everything you find in the life, you find in the net as well. You find work and boring stuff and you find fun. So coming back to our topic of today. <laughs> Um, is rather do women and men find different things on the web or do they behave differently and do they feel more welcome in some spaces than they do in others and that is that is really an interesting question because in in a certain way communication seems although it reflects communication pattern in the normal life um, there seem to be some differences which is probably because people don't look into each other's eyes if they do commentaries on blogs or discuss in online forums. And if you can't see the immediate reaction of the person you are telling off in a written and probably not very polite way, um, then you tend to do it even less polite and even more direct. And then the communication culture on these platforms sometimes really deteriorates to a rather low level. And I, I believe that speaking on average, it's not for every single individual, but speaking on average, the sensitivity of women to bear with these communication standards, I would say, is just higher. So it's earlier that women say, I just can't deal with this way of communicating. Hmm. Not with me and not seeing it being done to others, so they rather back off. And that leads in some of those discussion forums to significantly lower participation of women too. It's not just lack of interest. What, what, would you, what do you think is the main reason why women refuse to deal with this communication forum? I'm just trying to explain that because it's in that these cases it's no fun if people start insulting each other and it's not a very constructive discussion culture it's just I mean I don't want to discuss in a forum where people just virtually shout at each other and it's 
that is no fun then and I have sometimes the impression that it's not an argument based interaction but it's bitching about something and why would I waste my time on this low level communication if it leads to nothing and I believe that many people male and female think exactly the same but the resistance of men to just ignore some of this and think oh it's a troll I don't don't take that person's comment serious and just overread it they they find it easier to do this it's probably the only thing you can do with these comments just ignore them but for women it's harder especially experience shows that more often than men women get comments which have a sexual connotation hmm. and it just hurts hmm. in, a, in a various sense you are now in a in a party in the pirate party you're discussing everything or some everything on Twitter and in other kind of forums how is it for you to follow all this discussion challenging <laughs> <laughs> but I, of course I can't follow all those discussions yeah with the pirate party there are two things to say in this context first it's also still a male dominated environment and it has a very a very dynamic and open communication uh, style so the things I described before you find them in pirate forums pretty often um, but on the other hand they really like to debate fiercely everything about everything and all the time so that that leads to mumble meetings which are four hours long and go after midnight and then you really start women more often than men is my experience to think how much of these four hours was really making sense communication <laughs> and how much was kind of wasted time and women find it often harder to waste time they think <laughs> I could instead do something else useful you want you know? to come well, on that I just want to for a little bit of perspective I mean if you become a politician or if you engage in a, a political debate and this is more for you know potential future uh, parliamentarians or representatives of a political party you get a lot of shit thrown at your face and for me it, it doesn't matter if I'm a man or a woman it's just a function of being a politician because you're accountable you're visible and people are angry sometimes or people don't have anything better to do and they throw stuff and I think it's usually just part of the job sometimes I respond with humor like when people say oh my god uh, like yesterday my Twitter name is Marietje and then D66 is my political party name and then yesterday somebody suggested that maybe a six was missing I thought that was funny so I said thanks you know haha uh, and this morning also this uh, situation happened where I said something um, that someone didn't agree with the person gave some arguments and then said honey you know uh, afterwards okay and I didn't respond because I think it's not the worst of all insults I don't like it but I don't really <laughs> care either uh, but then immediately a professor um, I think it's a professor or someone else on Twitter who's a commentator on economic affairs said uh, you know block this guy what a what a freak to say honey to you I mean don't accept it so the beauty I think of, of social media for example is also that in these discussions it becomes a lot more visible what people say and then other people interfere I mean I will often kind of uh, go online after a few hours or, or see my Twitter again and sometimes a whole discussion has already taken place about what somebody said about me or to me so um, good luck if you want to <laughs> go into politics because it's part of the job but we can all I think change it with a little bit of humor as well because I think social media sometimes or technology makes for the concept of abstraction and distance between people I mean sometimes people say something that's not so nice and then when you respond it makes them realize oh it's actually a person it's not just an avatar not just a little screen mm. so mm. I think the place where the most people are uh, are not as nice are in the hacker scene. All these nerds. Could you give us? <laughs> okay, <laughs> just <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> you know uh, what? What did the the female hacker told you about how they feel in these networks? It's interesting because I, I grew up being on 4chan and oh, like okay. online forums. Nice that are place. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It, hypothetically, those are very gendered places where there's a lot of um, hatred towards women. 
but I always masked my identity like everyone else, so no one knew I was a woman. And I often found it interesting that men were usually the ones defending women. If, if a man you know, made a gendered comment to someone who was obviously female on, on one of the message boards, it would often be other men attacking that first man. So it often didn't need to be me you know, attacking them as another woman. It was usually men who were getting really angry about, about sexist comments. And I, I found that really heartening in a way that I think a lot of geek guys in recursive subcultures, especially around open source software, of my generation anyways, are very conscious of gendered experiences and are often, I, I would say they're on my side as, as for me being an, a front-end developer and coder on the internet. So I've had a very positive experience with men engaging with me digitally, whereas I, I was in politics in, in Canada where I'm from and I found there when, when you're more of a figurehead, when you can't anonymize yourself, when you're not talking about code, when it, I think it then becomes much more political and it becomes a lot more personal. So, I mean, it, from my, my experience was that men were, were very positive and very supportive in hacker cultures, and a lot of the women of my age said that. But women of the generation before us often said that they felt a lot of discrimination in, in their online engagements. So maybe something has changed in the last 20 years that's allowed men of my age to maybe understand female experiences, understand how isolated we are. I don't know, I, I think maybe you might have engaged with these spaces a, a few years before me and maybe, I don't know, would you say that anything has changed on like online forums in the last decade or? <laughs> the last two decades. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> um, well, that depends of course on the forum, but um, I was talking about the pirates, so what I saw with the pirates is that in the last two years, within the pirates, that culture changed a lot. So you still see the things I was describing today, but today you see exactly what you described, that many, many male pirates really um, get angry at somebody else who poses sexist commentaries. Mm -hmm. That happens every day, that they oppose and stand up and that they... Um, defend a better communication culture and I also have to admit if that did not come across in my first uh, commentaries that I've never in my life met as many male feminists like in the pirate party yes sounds surprising but it's really still true. surprising yeah it's still true yeah you may find others as well but um, you can still read in media that they are all post-gender. That's not true. A year ago, maybe many thought they are post-gender, but meanwhile, there was an educational process within the pirates, and now they know that post-gender is a very good vision, but it's not there, and you cannot ignore a problem because then it will never be solved. So you have to acknowledge reality as it is and not do as if it were not there just because you don't like it and then try to change it in order to reach your vision and the vision may be post-gender. If it comes to politics, everything is about networks and building networks. Uh, you know, there are all these old boys networks. Um, do, do we need more female networks or are female networking another way? Or how would you describe it? Um. I think that there are a lot of female networks that are um, probably not, not as visible in the public. But I'd like to, to ask you a question. If you, if you compare the other parties to, to the pirate party, which is more, more of a digital party than, than based um, in the other world, do you think it's, it, it's a chance for, for openness to women? Is a digital party possibly more open for that? That's an interesting question. Uh, I'm not sure that has to do with the digital channels and actually pirates meet more often than people think. Uh, I'm a pirate in the state of Brandenburg and they have um, four um, state party conventions in one year. Which other party does have that? And some of those conventions are two full days from morning till evening. So we can spend, if we want, and lots of people do it, a lot of face-to-face -face time together and really discuss in real life. And actually, for me, real life happens in the internet too, so I don't really like those labels. It's real if people tweet about this panel, for example. Yeah. But I think 
One difference is that I perceive the pirates to be more open, more genuine, and that also means that you get the real thinking more often. So in other parties, maybe they are more politically correct, but they still probably are very conservative. Whereas an average pirate party member is rather modern and couldn't care less if a woman goes into IT. I mean, it's nice to have them there is probably their reaction, yeah? So the general value of pirates, of equality, regardless gender, race, origin, social background, sexual preferences, that's a real built into the pirate DNA, this equality over all those aspects. That makes it rather easier for feminists to lobby for gender equality because the general notion of equality is already there. And it's really in most cases where um, a not so ideal treatment takes place is lack of, lack of awareness. But it's not a, not a closed door. So if you make them aware of how certain things um, come across, the average pirate is very open and able to change. And this is something I like. And this is something I see much less in other parties. They mm -hmm. seem to be cut and concrete. Like and in Teresa's party. <laughs> yep. Um, yeah, what we see, uh, we started looking at why uh, we don't have as many female members as men. And uh, when you look at the party structure, what you can see is that you start losing the very active women who were younger when they start having kids. Mm. And because the party is, is not open to digital participation, we have uh, women raising their kids and not being able to participate in the party activities anymore. So, so we hope that with opening the party for digital participation, we can make an effort to get these women back and to um, have people who stay at home and raise their kids and really you don't have a lot of time when you're raising kids. Um, maybe you can spend time online and still be part of the um, party without going to meetings but having meetings on, on, online. Do you see first results of this? Um, the party isn't open to digital participation yet. Okay. So it's, um, Wh when are you going to start? <laughs> it's, it's always taking okay. a lot of time. Yeah, but w what's your impression about that? Well, I just wanted to say one more thing about women's networks because uh, I think they serve an important purpose. Uh, I think sometimes it helps to just share experiences or to uh, you know just get to know each other. But my experience has also been that women can feel threatened by other women and that women are often each other's worst enemies. So. I don't know. Uh, I don't think it's all sort of, you know, gender-based. What, make what makes you say this? Um, I, I hear it a lot. I see it a lot myself. So uh, I think that there was a generation of women who, who have really fought much harder than my generation has to to get access to, you know, power platforms or politics or, politics or a business position. <coughs> But that it's not always easy to s to open up again for a new generation or for a new uh, person. I mean, there's also real competition the higher up you go, and I think that that will be very interesting if you look at the pirate party, which is you know in general a sort of a network structure where hierarchy and power have not really uh, needed to play out yet. But eventually, with you know taking responsibilities and taking on roles uh, in the sort of existing political environment. Uh, I, I'm just curious to see how it will change then because I think that sometimes can lead to sort of more rigid decisions, uh, real questions about who gets a position and who doesn't, who is accountable for making those decisions and how, and then it will somehow have to meet the middle between this new and open and networked structure and the existing and sometimes very, very tough uh, power structure. So I think that's fascinating about the Pirate Party actually. My last question. What, what could you do to encourage more women to get into politics? Uh, well, I don't know. I think we all have to make sure that people are willing to serve the public cause again. Um, you know, we need more entrepreneurs uh, 
to go into politics. We need more inclusion in general of different people. We need representative democracy to be more representative, to be honest. And I think we can all ensure that the environment that people work in is actually, you know, manageable uh, and okay. I know a lot of people, if I ask like entrepreneurs, people who have a business, have you ever thought about going into politics? Because a lot of people have great ideas, sometimes so wonderful that I think, well, why don't you do it yourself? And a lot of people respond by saying, you think I'm crazy? Uh, and then, you know, I used to run my own business, so uh, I'm usually, you know, I can say, well, I don't think I'm crazy, and I think it's really worthwhile, but the, the, the environment is very tough. Um, it's a lot of hard work. And um, I can understand that there are people who, who wonder uh, in today's environment if that's what they want to do, if they want to stick out their neck, have such a public life, etc. But what I try to do personally is to always be available to um, give people advice, to give people opportunities to learn uh, and to try to help talents believe in themselves. Uh, and this is not uh, necessarily gender focused, but uh, I think it's something that we owe to the next generation and possibly it could help inspire them to think that you can also change a system from within and not only from you know activism on the outside. Uh, and I hope that eventually that will make a difference. I mean, I, I hope that I can be, um, sometimes people tell me, but a role model for some people. I, I notice this, especially when I travel to countries like Egypt, uh, where a lot of women have never ever in their lives seen a politician uh, who's female. Um, it's, it's, it's something that for me should be integrated in everything I do and it's not something that I think on Sunday afternoon, okay, now I'm gonna uh, spend time focusing on women's issues. I think it's an important part of what I believe in and hopefully I can translate that into the things I do in daily life but again I focus on international affairs international trade and digital agenda so that's you know the substance of what I work on but sure I have focus on you know what it means to be uh, a woman in a transition society how we have to make sure that laws also reflect their needs and their rights I mean it's just a part of the bigger picture mm. and for you I would say a, a lot of it as well is, is an age issue. Like I uh, recently was with a group of about 20 women um, at a local meeting in London and someone asked who of these women vote and not one person raised their hands. And I thought that is truly harrowing and I was wondering why they weren't voting so we started having a discussion about it and basically they said they feel entirely disempowered by the political system in, in England in this case. And we were talking about how, how could we feel more empowered as young people in our 20s millennial generation. And people were saying that what they would like to see more of is more citizen caucuses, more local groups, more local politics, that it's more accessible to people my age. Because for us who've grown up being deeply digital and being very participatory on the web and in our virtual environments, we kind of need to be hands-on in order to care about something. So yeah, I think for me it would be, even myself, I would like to see more in-person meetings, you know, maybe par party style where people who are citizens can get involved in their own political system. Is there a party you want to join? In the UK yes. or in Canada? Yeah. <laughs> um, hmm. It's very hard. I, I would not actually say that I believe in any of the mainstream political parties in the UK right now. Why? I would say the only party that has given me any hope as a young okay. person is the Pirate Party. Okay. It's different in Canada, but in, in the UK. Interesting, <laughs> interesting answer. Yeah, and I'm not alone in that in that viewpoint, obviously. Okay. Yeah, which is sad in a way. <laughs> um, yeah, what Maritia said is very important. We have to ask and encourage women to run because once once we ask them, mo most are going to say yes and run. They just have to be a little bit encouraged. Then. Um, uh, us working in parties, we have to help uh, tr build another image for parties because it can be a lot of fun working in parties. It's not all men in suits talking all day long. What, what's the fun for you in working for a party? Well, I've been working for a party for three years because it's a lot of fun and, and you, you realize you can actually change a lot of things. So if, you, if you're dissatisfied and if, if you want to change something, just join a party. Voting is not enough. And then uh, we, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, and and we need role models. And looking at my party, uh, three elderly men in suits 
are just not attractive to young people. Someone has to keep that. If, if, you, if you want uh, young people to vote and to become politically active, you have to put up role models who, who can actually talk to a younger crowd. Okay. How did I come to the Pirate Party? I was talking about topics of the Pirate Party for years already, so what happened ever and ever again, the Pirates came to me and said, why are you a member of the Green Party? You belong to us, come over. <laughs> and about five or six times I answered, I'm really sorry, but you are just men and in a male environment. You know, I'm a little sensitive and feminist, etc., etc. Not enough women, I don't go there. And then the last time I said that, that pirate looked me into my eyes and said, you know what, if all women would answer what you said, that would never change. Do you want to be guilty for that never to change? <laughs> Come over and help change it. And that really made me thinking. And that little encouragement <laughs> was actually enough. So together with a very bad uh, campaigning at the last state elections in North Rhine-Westphalia and Schleswig-Holstein of the Greens, which was a pirate bitching, I decided, oh no, that's really not my place anymore. I, I do belong to the pirates and that was a really very good decision. But I really now, I mean, my, my major topic is still open government, transparency, freedom of the internet, things like that but I still take the other responsibility to help change that other aspect. And one thing, I think we've mentioned that at the beginning, why women don't like to go where few women are is because they don't see women being there, which means you have to be visible. You have to become visible as a role model. You have to help other women to appear on radar screens. For example, put them on panels, have them be interviewed by media, that it's not always the same male nerd from Berlin, the face of the pirate party, but a more diverse picture. And then just invite other women to come along and, and tell them, if you don't like the world like it is, try to change it. And being in politics is one way to change it. And if you don't go there, the world may change in a direction others want, and it may be a different direction than the one you want. Mm. So just try changing and if that doesn't work we can still complain but complaining without trying to change yourself it's just bad complaining you know? <laughs> great last word I think we have to finish thanks a lot thanks my panelists Yeah, thank you very much for sharing your stories um, on our Women in Tech Day. So we'll continue with talking about gender language in about five minutes. Thanks.